CSI Starbase. Special Report. Good evening. Thank you all for joining me here today. Please be seated. My name is Judarius Ruliani. Now I understand that may be a bit tough for some of you to pronounce, so you can feel free to call me Judy. I am the self-appointed private investigator for Mr. Eric Ralph. The reason I've gathered you all here today is to discuss an incident that I think deserves an apology from Mr. Elon Musk, Chief Executive Officer of the Space Exploration Technologies Corporation. Exactly one standard Earth year ago today, Elon Musk told Eric Ralph, senior spaceflight reporter at Tesla Rati, one of the biggest lies that we have ever been able to document after searching back through the entire history of his life as an adult. The egregious falsehood I am referencing here today is in relation to this article written by my client, Mr. Ralph, on the popular online website known as Tesla Rati. At the end of this article, Mr. Ralph issued the following statement. It is possible that the tank farm and launch mount plumbing are much closer to completion than expected, meaning that Super Heavy Booster 4 could remain at the orbital pad until it's completed several crucial cryogenic proof and static fire tests. Of course, short of confirmation from Musk himself, we'll just have to wait and see. That, my friends, is responsible journalism at work. Awaiting confirmation from the respected source before making claims which could be perceived as false or downright impossible. Following its publication, Tesla Rati shared a link to the article on their Twitter account, which at the time had more than 500,000 followers. It was on this day, September 10th of 2021, where Mr. Elon Musk responded with the following statement. Boost a static fire on the orbital launch mount, hopefully next week. Hmm. Let the record show that it was in fact Exactly 333 days after the statement was made before any super heavy booster was able to actually perform a static fire on the orbital launch mount. Please understand that I'm aware that the delay in booster testing was a function of a cataclysmic amount of variables, most of which were probably outside of Mr. Musk's direct sphere of influence. However, in the case of this completely unnecessary tweet, I am thoroughly convinced that Mr. Musk was fully aware that there was practically a 0% chance that the events that he was foreshadowing in this response would ever take place. With that being said, I will now present to you the following evidence to justify this claim. With this overwhelming amount of support and material, I think you will all agree that it is only fair and proper that Mr. Elon Musk issue my client, Mr. Eric Ralph, a public apology. With that, let's look at some of the information that Zach from CSI Starbase was kind enough to gather for this investigation. Article 4, Section 20. September 10th, the day of Elon's tweet. The gigantic LR11350 Super Crane, lovingly referred to as Kong, was still on site. It wouldn't leave for another month or so. The important thing to know about this crane is that it's basically a rental. In other words, it is not owned by SpaceX. Now, I'm not privy to the terms of the insurance plan or something like that, but I'm pretty sure one of the stipulations is that there are no static fires within a half mile of our super ugly crane. This means that in order to perform said static fire, they would have to be required to lay calm down, dismantle everything, and then transport it away from the launch site until after the static fire. Now that is a colossal waste of time and money. Some of you might be thinking, well, may maybe they could have just moved it somewhere safe at the launch site. But as you can see, good luck with that. The landing pad was a mess at this time while the chopsticks were being constructed. So there wasn't really anywhere safe for it to go. Next, we have this wooden elevator box at the base of the launch mount. 
<laughs> now I'm no expert in flame propagation dynamics, but I have a feeling this wouldn't have survived without catching fire, especially since it's located in between the two legs of the OLM. So essentially, one sixth of the total Raptor exhaust would end up going straight through this structure. Of course, they could have removed it in a week, but that actually didn't happen for several more months. So let's just consider it toast. Same goes for that scaffolding on the opposite side of the launch mount. I would like to believe that there was a 0% chance that SpaceX would leave this bundle of shrapnel in that location for testing, but you never know. The obvious reason to move it is because in the event of a rud, or something like this, all of that scaffolding would likely end up scattered throughout the tank farm. This is especially true considering the fact that the berm that is supposed to protect the tank farm from the aforementioned Raptor exhaust and over a pressure events did not exist yet at the time. This means that the fluids bunker, which would later be protected by this berm, would instead become the berm. Well, that sounds like a bad day for all them high pressure gas canisters on the roof of the fluids bunker. These canisters store high pressure gases used to fill COPVs on the booster and starship. They're also used to spin up and ignite the outer 20 Raptor engines. From left to right, we have two CH4 canisters, which appear to be connected, as well as the three nitrogen canisters. Those seem to be connected as well. Next to those, we have the gaseous helium, and then a smaller gaseous oxygen canister. But if you look closely, you will see that the helium and oxygen tanks weren't connected to anything. Therefore, I'm pretty sure we have ourselves a problem because those COPVs are gonna require some healing. Yes, some of you might say, well, there appears to be a worker over there getting them hooked up as we speak. Sure, if we zoom in, we can see this umbrella, which is the clear sign that there was in fact adding some of the pipes to the helium canisters. And maybe they could have gotten to the oxygen ones in less than a week as well. Fine, I'll let you have that one, but it doesn't end there. If we look at the igniter panels on the side of the launch map, as you may now understand a lot better thanks to that CSI Starbase investigation a few weeks ago, these panels are responsible for the actual ignition of the outer 20 engines. Off first appearance, it might look like these are ready to go. But in fact, if we look at the bottom of the panel, you will see that these two were not functional. Um, for reference, this is what they look like now. You can see the three pipes coming up from the, the walking platform and connecting to the three igniter panels. Looking back at the previous image, taken from the day of the incident in question, you will note that these smaller pipes are in fact not even present at all. So that means that if there was a static fire, without these igniter panels, they would not be able to test any of the outer 20 Raptor engines. And that remains true even if all of the other important tasks I previously mentioned had been magically completed in less than a week. Well, that's fine. Maybe they could just do the center nine then, you know? Igniter panels aren't necessary for those, right? Just use the four COPV tanks and start up the center engines. Well, I want you all to take a look at this before you jump to conclusions. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. As you can see, the booster quick disconnect, which is responsible for tank pressurization, filling up the COPVs, and putting the damn fuel into the booster was naked. And I'm not talking about the cool looking lobster shell cover either. I'm talking about the cryogenic flex hoses that attach to the back of the QD and supply the necessary liquids and gases to the booster fuel tanks, which is something I think we can all agree might be important thing to have for a static fire attempt. But nope, on September 10th, the day of Elon's egregious deposit of misinformation in reply to my client's article, these flex hoses were nowhere to be found. And that's not the worst of it. If we look at the actual cryo tubes that deliver the fuel to those flex hoses, you will notice that the massive double set of curved pipes that go from the top of the legs of the launch mount to the bottom of the QD, you guessed it, didn't even exist yet. In fact, they were still being welded together on the landing pad. They weren't installed for another two weeks, and even after that, 
It took an additional week before the crowd tubes coming out of the ground were connected to the ones going up the legs of the launch mail. So we have to ask ourselves, is this just another example of Elon time? I don't think so. Because if we go back and look at the tank farm, we can see that a few more critical components were missing as well. For the sake of time, I'm gonna breeze through these quickly and just list them off. <clears throat> Important tank farm components needed for a static fire. Two, horizontal storage tanks that are responsible for methane reclamation after a detank. Uncheck. Functioning liquid oxygen pumps, heat exchangers, and all associated piping needed for loaded oxidizer onto the super heavy booster. Uncheck. Functioning liquid methane pumps, heat exchangers, and all associated piping needed for loading fuel onto the super heavy booster. Uncheck. Functioning liquid oxygen storage tanks in at least one of the two liquid nitrogen tanks which are needed to super chill the locks before loading it onto the booster. Uncheck. Without the cryo jacket shells placed over these tanks, there was no way to connect any of the piping for the third liquid oxygen tank or either of the two nitrogen tanks. Now last, but certainly not least, functioning methane storage tanks. Now, I don't think I need to tell you people that these vertical methane storage tanks were not ready for use, nor would they ever be used to contain liquid methane. Matter of fact, I'm willing to bet the day that Elon sent out this misleading tweet was the same day SpaceX found out that they would not be able to use these tanks for methane storage. And if that's the case, I truly am sorry, E, from the bottom of my heart. Because honestly, that news was pretty devastating, not only to me, but to all the other SpaceX fans who knew the ramifications when it came to being ready for the first orbital test flight. But that does not give you the right to blatantly lie to Mr. Eric Ralph in public. You can do it in private all you want. That is not my concern, but in public, now that is inexcusable. I'm sure you all agree. It is not, however, unforgivable, which is why I come before you today to formally request an apology from Mr. Elon Musk himself to be publicly delivered to my client, Eric Ralph, sometime in the next 72 hours. If not, that's fine. You are your own man, but it's gonna be a lot harder to trust you in the future. I mean, how do we know you won't do it again? For example, you say SpaceX will perform 33 engine static fire on the orbital launch mount sometime in the near future. Is that even possible? Do the clamps of the launch mount even have the capability of holding back the force of all 33 engines? If we look at this diagram of one of these alleged hold down clamps, th this was posted on Twitter over a year ago. You can see that th there's these tiny little pistons, these tiny little pistons that push the clamp forward onto the edge of the booster to hold it in place. You expect us to believe that these tiny little pistons can hold down a super heavy booster with all 33 engines firing, you have got to be f Whoa, that was crazy. Why is he so aggressive? I've got one question that was like, what made you think that that was a good idea? I mean, look, Jeff, all he asked for was a, a record of orbital launch mount readiness for the month of September. That's definitely not what I thought he was gonna use that information for when he requested it. I mean, he made some pretty good points, but I, I, I highly doubt Elon would ever send out a public apology for something like that. Wait, yo, he might be here right now. Oh man, yo, I gotta leave before yeah, this gets Wait, awkward. man, what, what about the OLM clumps? Do you think they, what he said was true? Oh, well, you mean the part about the launch mount clamps not being able to hold down 33 engine booster static fire? Well, I have seen a lot of rumblings online recently in various places, and they've been kind of getting stronger by the day. But I don't really think there's anything to worry about here, Jeff. 
3D forensics agent Ryan Hansen Space actually figured this one out for us recently, so I suppose we can dig into it quickly before I have to leave for the night. So I think the source of all this commotion is that picture that he showed in the press conference, and if we look at it closely, you can kind of understand why folks would say something like this. In my opinion, the only way you could possibly come to the conclusion that the clamps are not able to hold back the force of all 33 engines without breaking free of its constraints is if you have seen this photo. The reason for that is because of how small these pistons are that actuate the hold down clamp. It's so small, in fact, that if we don't zoom in pretty heavily on this image, it's hard to even notice that it's there. Surely there's no way that 20 pistons are able to supply enough force to keep the booster from breaking free unexpectedly, right? Now, I usually don't like to do math when I'm not at work, but I think it's worth breaking my rule for this one. According to Elon Musk, the Raptor 2 engines each put out roughly 230 tons of thrust. Multiplying that by 33 gives us 7,590 tons. This means that at 100% throttle, each of the 20 clamps would be experiencing 380 tons of force in the upwards direction. If we multiply that by 0.4 in order to account for the Raptor's deep throttle capability, allowing it to drop all the way down to 40% of its maximum thrust, that would give us 152 metric tons of force on each clamp. That's quite a lot of force for any hydraulic actuator to have to deal with. And for one of this size, I imagine it would blow every single hydraulic line pretty much immediately if that were the only thing holding it down. With that being said, there has to be something that we're missing here in this equation. Number one, we have to consider the weight of the booster and the propellant that it carries. A super heavy booster with a fully loaded liquid oxygen and methane tank weighs roughly 3,500 tons. So if we were able to calculate what percent of maximum thrust is needed to match the weight of the booster, you would end up with a number somewhere around 46%. As I mentioned before, the Raptor engines have the capability of deep throttling all the way down to 40%, which means a fully loaded booster should be enough to make it so the net force is still pointed in the downward direction. In other words, the pistons wouldn't really need to do much. The problem with this is that it seems SpaceX prefers to do these static fire tests with as little methane in the tanks as possible. It's probably not really a good idea to do these kind of tests with that much fuel on board anyways. To reduce the overall maximum damage potential of a rapidly unscheduled disassembly, this is probably a good choice. One way around this is to fully stack the Starship on top of the booster and then fill the Starship's LOX tank as well. I'm going to spare you all the math here, but with this configuration, you would end up with a full stack weighing roughly 3,700 tons or 48% of the maximum thrust, which is a bit of an improvement. So are these the only options that SpaceX has if they want to perform this test without damaging the hydraulic actuators on the hold down clamps? What if I told you that the hydraulic actuators for the clamps aren't even installed right now? Uh, if that's true, I would say that don't make no damn sense and somebody at SpaceX don't gone crazy. According to 3D forensics agent Ryan Hansen Space, who did a pretty deep investigation into this, the hydraulic actuators were actually removed prior to Booster 7 being placed on the launch mount. Using this image from RGV Aerial taken on August 5th, we can see that the clevis pins holding the end of the piston rod has actually been removed. So this means that the static fire we saw the other day was likely performed without them. It turns out they don't really plan to use them for holding the booster down onto the launch mount at all. In fact, it appears their only job is to retract the clamps to allow the booster to quickly jump off the pad like one of those trampolines Ross Cosmos used to talk about. I think the term hold down only applies during the static fires and for that job, SpaceX is not relying on these 20 hydraulic pistons. And for good reason too, because if one of them were to fail, it would drastically increase the amount of force being exerted on the remaining clamps, causing them to get overloaded one by one until the entire hold down mechanism fails. Instead, once the booster is placed on the launch mount, SpaceX workers install 40 of these turnbuckles which are mounted to either side of the hydraulic pistons in the center of the clamp. Thanks to Ryan, we are able to visualize what this looks like since we don't have any images showing the entire clamp in one single frame. You can see that these turnbuckles aren't much longer than the hydraulic pistons. They are actually about the same size as well. The difference is that these will not rely on hydraulic fluid in order to do their job. These should be significantly stronger than the little micro pistons. The other thing to consider is that there are two times as many of them. When SpaceX is finally ready for the first orbital flight attempt, these turnbuckles will obviously have to be removed. 
I would say the day these pistons are reinstalled and the turnbuckles are removed will be a sign that we are getting close to that first orbital launch attempt. I want to give a huge thank you to Ryan Hansen Space for all the hard work he put into figuring this one out and to model it for today's episode. Unfortunately, this is all we have time for today because I seriously have to go. But don't worry, you won't have to wait three weeks for the next episode because part three of the Orbital Launch Mount Deep Dive will be out sometime this week. In that episode, we will discuss all the updates to Star Factory and revisit the Mega Bay progress. We will also do a short deep dive into how SpaceX is preparing the chopsticks for catching a super heavy booster. After that, we will explain a critical feature of the orbital launch mount which I believe SpaceX might be afraid to use for some reason. And finally, we will discuss the major updates to the launch procedure for the super heavy booster that Elon Musk confirmed in his response to my tweet a few weeks ago. If you enjoyed this episode, please do us a favor and hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe as well if you haven't already. If you would like to support the channel, you can do so by joining as a YouTube channel member or becoming a monthly subscriber on Patreon. Just so you all know, we are currently raising funds for an upgraded camera. Our plans are to graduate from the unfit Nikon D5600 that we're using currently to a Canon C100, which we are hoping will drastically improve the quality of the skits that we do in these shows. If you would like to donate directly towards the camera fund, you can do so by clicking on the PayPal link in the description of this video. Thank you to all of the Patreon and YouTube members who have supported us up to this point. I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Last but not least, before we go, I want to give a huge shout out to Starship Gazer and RGB Aerial Photos who provided us with the majority of the images used in today's episode. If you would like to access all the imagery we used in this episode, you can find them on each of their respective Patreon pages, which I have linked in the description of this video. With that, it's time for me to get back to work. Make sure you all set your alerts for this channel because you won't want to miss what we have for this next episode. Stay Zero Zach, signing off.